we didn't have the Holy Spirit, folks. It'd just be kind of a mechanical thing. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 24 this morning, please, and verse number 16. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 16. The infallible text says, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Father, I pray now that you bless the reading of your word, the seed as it goes forth. May it fall on good ground, Lord, and of all things may you be glorified. Bless this messenger today and help me now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to preach you a message this morning entitled, The God of the Second Chance. This is for somebody. The God of the Second Chance. At my home, in my study, on the wall, is the picture that I downloaded from the internet of a pastor and his wife. I mentioned them to you the other day in the preaching. I forget exactly how long it's been. But this woman, his wife, former former. Uh, pastor's wife in the church, was in a bar selling herself, selling her body so that she could buy something to drink. Her husband was there while this was going on, and they both were arrested because of public prostitution. Now, when I got that and read that, I brought a message in this house, a few things and points that God gave me about these two people. But I put them on the wall. When I got home, I put them up there for this reason and this reason alone. That is that when I look up there and see them on that wall, it gives me an inspiration to pray for those two people. I pray for them. I am not against them. I am for them. For there's somebody out there that that woman has prayed with in the past. There's somebody out there that that preacher has preached to in the past. There's somebody out there right now whose heart is broken when they think about where their former pastor and their former pastor's wife is and what they're doing at this right at, right at this moment on this Sunday morning. There's no doubt that Satan has used this against the kingdom of God. No doubt that the enemies of God have found an occasion to blaspheme. That's all, whatever it is, whatever it is. But I'm going to tell you this, this preacher is going to pray for them. For I want to see them restored. I want to see joy on the face of this woman. And I want to see power in this man's life again. You say, something like that can't happen. Oh, listen. <laughs> no, listen to me this morning. Don't you ever, ever, ever limit God. He's able to do above and beyond all that you could ever ask or think. Just think of what he's done in your life. Just think of where he's brought you from. And the many times that you've come to him and you've laid your heart and bared your soul before the Lord and said, God, I never thought I could ever do what I've done. Would you forgive me for it? And you felt the sweet Holy Spirit come down in your soul and cleanse you of whatever sin or rebellion that might have built up and God brought you back to him. He left the 90 and 9, went out into the field and he found you wherever you were bleating. And my friend, when he found you, he brought you back carried you as a lamb back to the flock. It's because he's the God of the second chance. I want you somehow or another to write that down in your soul. For there may be somebody listening to me this morning that you preached at one time. You pastored a church at one time. You carried the burden of our Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry at one time. Maybe you're a young man and you started out in the ministry and you were full of fire. You were full of zeal and you wanted to get something done for God. And then you realized of all the forces that were arrayed against you. And one thing after another began to fall about you until you woke up one morning and said to yourself, I'm an absolute and complete failure. How in the world could God use somebody like me? I want to tell you something this morning and hear me well. The God that I serve was the same yesterday and today and he will be forever. The God that I serve changes not. He said, he that keepeth Israel never changes. I am immutable. In plain words, he's almighty God. And every time I come to him, I'll find an inexhaustible source of what I need for my soul. Amen. So I'm going to talk about the God of the second chance. And I'm going to use some illustrations from the Bible to try to get a message like that across. And maybe, just maybe, just maybe, before you walk out of this house today, you'll find him dear to your soul again. Your joy will be restored. You'll walk 
walk with a power in your life again. The Bible will take on new meaning. Your prayer life will be restored. And you'll once again sing the songs of Zion. You'll take your harp from the willow and you'll play that harp and you'll play it for the glory of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Some of you came in this house downcast, defeated, war wallowing, sometimes in self-pity, beaten to death. If you've been listening to the devil, he's discouraging you. He's the accuser of the brethren. Anything and everything that he could possibly do to destroy your walk with God, he will do it. In the Bible, we have the story of Moses in Exodus chapter number 2 and verse 11. The Bible said it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. He went out into his brethren and looked on their burdens and spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. He said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me, as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. And the Bible says that he fled from Egypt. And he fled into Midian. Can you imagine the great one that led Israel from Egyptian bondage that stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. At one time he was fleeing from Egypt. At one time he was running scared from the Pharaoh. My friend, God is the God of a second chance. For it was from that burning bush that he spoke to Moses that time and said, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. A holy God has come down to meet with a mortal creature. And it is here that I'm about to lift you up beyond your wildest dreams. I'm going to do with you what you never thought you'd ever see in your life. Here you are a shepherd in the backside of the desert of Midian. But you are going to be a saint. Savior to all of Israel and lead them forth from captivity. The story of Moses is very inspiring. For the first 80 years of his life, he spun his wheels. It was only the last 40 years of the life of Moses that God's hand was in everything that he did. And he moved him and he used him and he used him for the glory of God. So my dear friend, maybe you're a Moses. Maybe you one time stood up and proclaimed God's truth, witnessed on the street, handed out tracts, faithful to the Lord, but something happened and you tucked your tail and you ran off to the backside of the desert of Midian. Well, let me tell you something. There's a burning bush in every life on this earth. There's a burning bush for every last one of us. There's a time when we come face to face with a holy God and he gets the message into our soul. It is not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen. It's not whether I can concoct or create some kind of a ministry it is what God lays before my very path when he begins to speak to my soul and he opens the door and there lying in front of you is a world you didn't know existed he is able he is above able he can do beyond what you could ever imagine today or that you'd come back to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob in the book of Job chapter 42 and verse 1 Job answered the Lord and said I know thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Let me say that another way. Well, here's what Job had just said. Job said, I have this understanding and wisdom from thee, but because of my own ignorance, I'm going to cover it up because I can't explain it and I can't understand it. So what am I going to do with it? That's the word of God. That is the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is how God uses us. He puts a treasure in your soul. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have something that is not man-made. It is the voice of God. It is the communication from the Lord. And if we'll only let the Holy Ghost, and He is the interpreter of the things, the deep things of God, it is the Holy Ghost that opens up our soul to begin to receive a revelation from the Lord. Don't we need that? Don't we need light? Don't we need understanding? Don't you know that you're far better off by listening to the voice of God than you are by trying to find your way around with a fleshly flashlight? to try to interpret everything that comes from God through the flesh. 
Our human mind is incapable of comprehending and receiving the deep things of God. No man knows the deep things of God but the spirit of man. And it is the Holy Ghost that opens up our spirit and gives us life and understanding. So it is with Job. Job said, I did a lot of preaching about you. I witnessed and talked to my neighbors and everybody knew that I feared God and I skewed evil. And that was true of Job. But here's what he said. He said, I have uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare to me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. That is the day that you start growing. That is the day that you begin to move away from the flesh. It is the day that you begin to see God for who he is. It is the day when you realize for the first time in your soul that he made you. And the one that made you is so infinitely above you. There is so much that God can do and give for us. But you've got to be able to look up. You've got to listen to him. And Job said, listen, I've preached, but I never understood till my eye began to see you. Can you see him? Have you heard him? Have you felt him? Have you walked with him? Do you understand him? Do you not know that the reason that you exist is for God? Do you not know that the prime end of man is to enjoy the Lord and for the Lord to enjoy you? And what you start on this earth is a communion and fellowship with God that nothing else can have. No angel can commune with God. No cherubim can fellowship with the Lord, but you can. And if you're being cheated out of that today, if you've been lied to by Satan, if you've been robbed of your heritage, it is because you're listening to the voice of the enemy of God and the enemy of man. Hunger for him. Seek him. As David said, my soul thirsteth after God as the heart after the, after the water brook. You need to build within your soul whatever it takes for you as a human being that desire to know and see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob then you'll know what a second chance is all about. You'll realize that the first chance may have been squandered, but the second chance may be on an elevation infinitely higher than the first one ever was. Some of you have lived for God, walked with God, tried to serve God, done everything you know to do for God, and in the process still slip away. Backslide, as they call it. And you wonder what's going on with me. Let me tell you what may be going on with you. It may be that that is nothing but preparation, preparing you, teaching you, and for you to learn that what God has in store for you is greater than anything you'd ever known before. The best days lie ahead and not behind. Amen. So it was with Job. He said, I abhor myself. David, David the great king. David, the one that we talk about so much. David was the one that was after God's own heart. It is David who is the only king, the only king that ever united the tribes of Israel together. It was David's throne that God said, I will establish in perpetuity. It was David that was man who was the sweet psalmist that wrote all these songs of joy and glory to God. But did you know that David was a failure over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? Yes, he was. Let me read just a few of them for you this morning. When Saul was chasing David to kill him, Jonathan had warned David. You know the story. You've read your Bible. You know that Jonathan said David and Jonathan had made a league. And, and they had uh, come to an understanding that if Saul's heart was intent on killing David, that the bow, the arrow, was to go beyond David. And he understood by that that he was not to come back to Saul, but he was to go on. He was going to become a fugitive. Well, it did. And David became a fugitive. You know what he did? He went into the camp of the Philistines. Bad choice. The Philistines where Goliath came from. 
bad choice. And when he got there, the word spread quickly. Hold on. Is not this the same David that met Goliath in the Valley of Elah? What's he doing coming to us? We'll do away with him. And David got word. And do you know what he did? The Bible said he went to the door. And he scratched and he clawed on the door. And he let the spittle run down his mouth like he was a madman. In plain words, he feigned to be insane. And you know it worked? Because of the superstition of these people. They didn't want to have anything to do with the crazy man. Afraid it might rub off on them. I wonder sometimes if it doesn't rub off on some folk. Scared to death because he was insane. Spittle was running down his beard. And so they sent him away. But here was the great warrior. Listen, here was the great warrior that had stood in the valley of Elah and stood before Goliath with five stones, a little sling. Here was a young man who displayed courage over all the armies of Israel. Yet he's running scared when he comes to Goliath's hometown and his people. That is a failure on the part of David, a big failure. Not only that, but David committed adultery with Bathsheba, killed Uriah. Big, big failure. The Amalekites destroyed Ziklag while David and some of his men were off in battle. And when David and his men came back to Ziklag, lo and behold, they found that the wives and the children had been carried off into captivity. Did you know at this point in David's life that the men gathered around him were ready to stone him to death? Read your Bible. They were ready to stone David to death because their wives and their children had been taken captive while they were out fighting. Big failure on the part of David. Absalom took the throne. He had sat in the gate. He took the throne. David left Jerusalem with his head bowed, weeping over his son. Big failure. He lost the kingdom. David, after time and again, he failed. You remember when he numbered Israel? You remember when that angel of the Lord stood there in Jerusalem and the living on one side and the dead on the other? Do you know what brought all that slaughter into Jerusalem? David. David's bad choice in numbering Israel over and over and over again. David made some bad, bad, bad choices. Then preacher, he ended his life as an abject failure. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Isaiah chapter number 55 and verse 3 says this. Incline your ear and come unto me. Here in your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even, listen to this, the sure mercies of David. What's that, preacher? That's grace. You remember when the Bible said that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Well, let me tell you something. When Jesse was standing there with all of his sons lined up before Samuel, there was a little shepherd boy out there in the field watching over the sheep that Eliab had made fun of. And that little shepherd boy had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God intended to take David and elevate him to the kingship. And he did. God, my, let me tell you something, dear friend. I have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I might have failed a thousand times. I might have fallen seven times as it says here but the day is going to come when God's going to pick me right back up because I am in the Lord Jesus Christ and I have found grace in the eyes of the Lord Amen you cannot destroy a man who takes hold of the cords of grace are you listening if you cast yourself at the feet of Jesus and take hold of the grace of God you cannot fail you may fail incidentally, temporarily, in something you put your hand to here, but you will not fail with God if you'll take hold of the cords of grace. And by the way, the cords of grace are attached to the, uh, attached to the heart of love, the love of God that knows no limit, that passeth understanding. So we read about David. Then there is Elijah, 1 Kings 19. Elijah is the one who stood before the 450 prophets of Baal, said, if God be God, worship him. If Baal be God, worship Baal. Do you know what happened? 
They cried and they cut themselves as their manner was all the way till the noontime and the blood gushed everywhere. Oh, Baal, they said, come down. Oh, Baal, here we are. Now's your opportunity to prove who you are. Baal, Baal, Baal. And Elijah looked at him and said, maybe he's off somewhere in the bathroom. Who knows? That's what he said. Per adventure, he got someplace and stumbled and fell. Somebody might, might need to prop Baal up like they did Dagon over there. You remember when they propped him up? You know, it's like back in the Old Testament when they stole Laban's gods. I'd hate to have a god that somebody could steal. I'd hate to have a god that you had to prop up. I'd hate to, Are you listening to me? I'd hate to have a god that I had to repaint, renew, recarve every once in a while and find a place for. The god that I serve is that everlasting almighty being. Amen. Yes! If there's any propping up done, it's going to be him propping me up, not me propping him up. Amen. Amen. So Elijah, Elijah was the one who confronted them. God showed him who God was. Hello, Elo, Eli, Yah, that's what his name means. Elohim is Jehovah. And so he proved. But then Jezebel, Elijah knew what kind of a woman Jezebel was. He knew there was no good thing in her. And word got to him that she was out for his hide. And so what did Elijah do? He took off. He ran. He ran. He ran. Well, God's done with Elijah. No, he's not done with him. He's going to use him. How's he going to use him, preacher? He said, I want you to take that man that's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen down there and I want you to anoint him as the next prophet in your stead. I want you to go and anoint this man as the next king of Israel. I want you to do this and I want you to do that. The anointing that God had put upon Elijah was still on Elijah and the mantle that Elijah bore, he put it on Elisha and the same power that Elijah had was transferred to Elisha. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Amen. Yes, amen. Hallelujah to God. You can't take it away from us. If God's given it to us, it's there. Amen. God may take my life, but he won't take the anointing. The call of God is forever. Christian, you've been anointed. You've got an anointing that no man needs to teach you. You can be taught of the Holy Ghost. And that anointing cannot be taken away from you. That means that the moment God saved you, he bought you, and you became his property. Now, you can serve the Lord in joy, and you can shout and praise God and walk with the Lord, and you can have the fellowship of the saints in your house and the peace of God in your heart and victory in your soul. Or you can scramble around and hem haw and cry and kick and stomp and kick the slats out of your crib and throw your rattler out the floor, and you can carry on like a baby the rest of your life. But if you're really born again, you're born again. Amen. 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 <laughs> and it's not the preacher you're serving, it's the Lord you're serving. Amen. I'm here today and gone tomorrow. That anointing will stay on you because you belong to him. You know what that means? You're consecrated Amen. unto God. Well, I'll finish up with these. I got a couple more here. You get into stuff like this, you can preach all day, but I don't have enough strength to preach all day. Aren't y'all glad? Amen. Manasseh in 2 Chronicles 33. Here's what it says about Manasseh. More for Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh was a bad character. He was wicked and vile. The child sacrifice that Solomon had brought into Israel, Manasseh uh, perpetuated, practiced. But then the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. Now, if you don't know anything about ancient history, you can find reliefs. A relief is something like you've got a, you've got a sheet of stone, and then you've got this part that just sticks out a little bit. It's like a drawing. It's, it's a relief. And you can see reliefs of the Assyrians. And you'll see them with their spikes or their lances or whatever you want to call it. And they'll have a human being impaled upon it. They were, they, they were, these, were, these were mean characters. They would come in and they would rape the women and they would take the children, little babies, throw them up in the air, catch them on their spear as they fell down. That's the kind of people we're talking about. Manasseh knew who his enemy was. 
the Assyrian was coming against him. Look what happens. The Bible said, Therefore the Lord brought the captains, the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, bound him with fetters, carried him to Babylon. Now watch this. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him and was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Boy, man, that tells me something about the God that I serve. I don't believe any of you in this house this morning have thrown babies up in the air and caught them on spikes. I don't believe any of you have done anything like these Assyrians have done. And Manasseh, Manasseh, Manasseh got right with God. And when he got right with God, God got right with him. Isn't that wonderful? So where you are, where you, where you at today? What kind of life are you living? Wasted, spinning your wheels, dead end. Bye. You want to wind up like that pastor and his wife? You can. There's a pastor up here in Ohio or Indiana or somewhere up in there. Pastored one of the biggest churches in this country. One of the biggest, folks. He's sitting up there in prison right now, trying to get out. He didn't hit the bottom. He bounced off of the bottom. Do you know what? I've prayed for him. His wife has divorced him. He's sitting up there, rotting away in prison. Say, so, well, a preacher, what difference does it make? Let me tell you what difference it makes, okay? Here's the difference it makes with me. I could be up there. I really know that. I could be in prison today for doing the same thing he did. You mean there's no more to me than that? Let me tell you something. There dwelleth in my flesh no good thing. The only thing that keeps me right with God is the Holy Ghost and a desire in the inward man to serve him and live for him. And ever I keep that fire in my soul to serve him and live for him. Or else my flesh will drag me down so fast just like it will you or anybody else. Now let's say you're down. Let's say you don't know what to do. Let's say you've gone to Christians and the Christians have kind of eyed you, you know, and they give you the same old pat answers. They don't really care. And the fact of the matter is you're going to find a lot of people when you're down, folks. And I don't want to make, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say it the wrong way, but you're going to find a lot of people that are going to be puffed up because of your circumstances because it's going to pick them up. It's going to make them feel so much better than you, see. They need that. They need that ego lift. Well, that's not the Holy Ghost. That's their flesh being lifted up. They're fleshly people. But you're going to find Christians who look at you with a sympathetic and empathetic eye, who want to bear your burdens and want to share, share their, their life with you. They want to pray with you. They want to bear you up. And if you find Christians like that, my dear brother or sister, get around them. Get around them. But I'm going to ask you this morning in the name of Jesus. He's the God of the second chance. Why don't you come down here this morning and tell him, Lord, Lord, I want to come home. I want to live for you again. I want my life to be a witness and a testimony. I want, go I want, I want some joy back in my soul, Lord. I want power in my life. I want some victory, Lord, because I've been beaten to death. Lord, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Isn't that a good old song? Lord, I'm coming home. Amen. Amen. Coming home. Just a few minutes ago, our brother right here got up and he walked out the back door. His little daughter walked out to the corner right there. A lot of you didn't see it, but I did. She walked out to the corner. She saw her daddy go through that back door. You know what she did? Here she went. And I thought immediately, I don't know why I think like this, but immediately I thought, that's the way we ought to be with the Father. Amen. That's the way we ought to be with the Father. We, can't, we, we don't want to live without him. Amen. 
We don't need anything come between us and him. That's the way we ought to be with the Father. We ought to say, Lord, I can't make it. I'm not going anywhere. Where yet? <laughs> I want to find him. And he'll hide himself from you. He'll hide himself from you for a reason. And maybe that's where you are right now with him. But you ought to come running to him as that little, sweet, little, precious girl ran to her daddy. You ought to come running to him. You ought to get up out of your seat right now and say, Lord, I want you back in my life. I want my father back. I want my father back. In Jesus' name. Father, bless your holy word now as it goes forth. Glorify yourself. I love you and I bless you. And I thank you a thousand times for where you brought me from. And I know where I'd be were it not for the grace of God. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray. And amen. Now stand up this morning.